an extension of the tang, but with that chomp of rice that I told you about yesterday. And they'll go all the way up to the Crusades, the Renaissance, the kingdoms of Mali and Songhai in West Africa, and the Aztecs and the Incas in the Americas. And if you really want to get cool, go way down to South of Africa. There's my favorite African civilization. Civilization, but remember what it is? Djibouti. Djibouti. That's a city <laughs> and it's a country. Where did I spend like six Zimbabwe. months? Zimbabwe. 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 All right. Zimbabwe. 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 All right. Djibouti is a country, and the capital of Djibouti is Djibouti. Djibouti. So you really can't go wrong. It's really beautiful, but kind of civil war right now. So be good. All right. 1279. Bad things for China. Oh, those Mongols who have been around forever and a day, have finally found a way to break in. And it is Kublai Khan and his Mongols that are going to destroy the great Song Dynasty. And so this is the Yuan or the Foreign Dynasty. And Kublai, try as he might, wants to keep the Chinese and the Mongols separate. He said, the Mongols were tough. We're used to being out on the Mongolian plain, living in our yurts. If we come in here to China, we're going to get soft. All right? We're going to be sucked in to all of their technology, all their luxury, and we won't be rough, tough Mongols anymore. But when you have access to really cool things, think of like being somebody with a candle going out to an outhouse. Or somebody who can go to a bathroom with an electric light switch and indoor plumbing. Which one do you choose? You guys are allowed to answer. Who said the outhouse? Is that you, Matt? The outhouse and the candy. Yeah, okay. Most people will be absorbed by the technology. And eventually this will happen to um, the Mongols. But Kublai Khan, grandson of Genghis Khan, he's got to live up to the reputation his cousins are way over in the eastern side, or excuse me, western side of, of Eurasia, and he's going to keep expanding. He's going to go back south, back into like, you know, Vietnam. Um, he's going to keep pushing um, down towards India, you know, reconquers the Koreas. And there's one country he just can't get, and that's Japan, the archipelago of Japan. Japan would not exist if it was not for Tang Dynasty China. And so Kublai Khan in 1274 sends an invasion fleet. But a hurricane blows up and it sinks Kublai Khan's armada. The Japanese are like, all right, got lucky there. Actually, they believe the emperor, the divine emperor, like Aang from um, Avatar. Yeah, the last airbender went down and was doing this, and you know, the waves started rocking and the wind started to blow and sank it. Kublai Khan's like, yeah, well, I'll show you guys. In 1281, he sends a bigger invasion fleet and it sinks. So he's like, you know what? Japan can stay there. Um, the good things that the Mongol Empire is going to do is it is going to invigorate the Silk Road. And a branch of it, by a group of, of Mongols who will convert to Islam, known as the Golden Horde, will go as far north into Russia. And they are going to connect Russia, different you know, um, trade goods and items come out of Russia and are connected into the Great Silk Road. This is the time where the Silk Road is running from the Pacific Ocean over to the Atlantic Ocean in France and over into the great city of Timbuktu in West Africa. And it's awesome. Horses, glass, porcelain, gold, salt, spices, slaves, you name it. If it can be traded at this time, it's going back and forth across the Silk Road. Um, this will help also spread the religion of Islam. More than just trade items are shared. It is ideas, it is technology, it is religion. So Islam will spread farther eastward 
as a result of the Silk Road, except all this is really good, except the Silk Road also, besides spreading good stuff, will spread bad stuff, bad stuff such as disease. disease. And so here is where the, split, the plague will spread over to southeastern Europe, up into northern Europe, and moving laterally, like a wedding cake, it climbs from south to north, killing a third of the people, not only in Europe, but also in Asia as well. It's thought about as a, as a European thing, but it's not. It goes all the way across to the Pacific Ocean, decimating millions and millions of people. Everybody good here? All right. Next up, we have the Qing Dynasty. All right. It's a big one. All right. Um, wait a minute. Did I miss one? The Ming Dynasty. I'm like, wait a minute, we had to miss one. The Great Ming Dynasty. All right, one of my favorites. Um, from 1300s, 1368 to 1644. So in this time period, contextually, Ming Dynasty, we're going to have the Age of Exploration and the beginning of the Columbian Exchange. The transatlantic trade is going to go on. Almost to the Age of absolutism. Down in Africa, again, we have Songhai and Mali and the Aztecs and the Incas over in uh, the New World. And the Ming Dynasty is just fabulous. It is centuries of unprecedented economic growth in China. Think of the Ming Dynasty as Pax Romana um, Chinese version, peace, unrivaled, prosperity. And the Mongols are overthrown by the Ming in 1368. And the Ming are the last real, true Chinese dynasty. Excuse me, God, you're right. Warm is bright. It's pretty gross. Ah. Um, when the Ming vanquish the Mongols, accessing all the technology and ideas of the Silk Road, and taking part of their production that was geared for war, they thrust it towards agriculture. Different tools, different fertilizers. So more food is grown. With more food equals, you can see it up there, a population boom. And also, China very brilliantly at this time creates a thing known as a senshi bank. Probably ideas from Arabic traders trading along the Silk Road. China is big. And so they're going to have seven or eight regional economies that are going to try and form a national one. Now why is that important? Well, if you are, speaking of China, anybody see what happened to that guy in Hong Kong yesterday? Or like, you know, early Monday morning? He was walking out of... Um, Endgame, talking about what was happening really loud. People told him to shut up, and he didn't, so they beat the snot out of him. And the cops were like, well, dude, you probably should have <laughs> shut up, all right? It's Endgame, all right? Be quiet. So I'm like, all right. So anyway, uh, anyhow, it's kind of funny. If you're in Shanghai, down in the south, and you need to go up to Nanking to buy something, you got to take bags of gold or silver, on a boat, up the Grand Canal, on a horse or donkey, and man, that stuff is heavy. Plus, there might be criminals, but if you have a bank, you deposit your money in a bank in Shanghai, and they issue you a letter of credit. All right, Max Miller has $80,000. He now takes the slip of paper all the way up to Nanking, he hands it to a branch of the Senshi Bank, and he can withdraw his money. It's safer. It, you don't have to travel with it. You can now buy goods cheap at the source and transport them back home. Think of the Bank of America. There is a branch in every large, major Chinese city. And in this time, there were 11 cities in China that had a population of or close to 1 million people. So the east coast of Japan, Japan of China, is where all the um, people are. And in the middle of this is the age of absolutism. All right? In France, Louis XIV is going to build Versailles. 
In Russia, Peter the Great is going to want to build the Winter Palace and name the city after himself. And China's like, well, yeah, man, those are cool, but we're going to show you really how to build a city. And they build the Forbidden City, which was a giant complex, complex, excuse me, that existed just to run the massive empire of China. In the middle was a palace. And when you went into it to meet the emperor, you went through this chute where the walls got narrower and narrower and narrower. You popped out to a giant cavernous room, and sitting up on a giant throne in the air was the emperor. It looked like he was floating. It was made to make you feel real small. And Ming China exists simply because of the Confucian civil service exam. The Chinese had perfected it. And around the globe, we're going to see empires rise and fall because primetime leaders like Louis XIV, like Peter the Great, don't train a successor. Well, in Ming China, they focused on this. You took your test. You passed it. You went out to govern a small village in the middle of nowhere. And you were evaluated. Five, six years later, if you passed your evaluation, they would allow you to take another test. If you passed it, you got to govern a mid-sized regional city, all right? a Pittsburgh, a Cleveland, a Buffalo, a Durham, a Raleigh. If you govern that one well, after five or ten years, you would get one shot, one time, to take the large metropolitan exam. If you passed it, you got to help govern a New York, a Philadelphia, Atlanta, a Dallas, a Los Angeles. Or you got to advise the emperor directly. Once people passed, they were super pumped, but if they failed, they could go no higher. And as these civil service um, scholars, schools open in every town and village, the scholars were so well trained, even when they had a weak hitter, kind of punky emperor, the scholars were so good, they kept the empire going. And when you're big and powerful, what do you want to do? Maintain that power. Maintain your power. You want to maintain that power, and you want to tell people how, how awesome you are. Look at me, I am Kathy Charles. What? What do you got, all right? So the Chinese, when they expanded, again, the hallmark of all strong Chinese dynasties is expansion. Well, they had an admiral, Chang He, Zhang Ho, same guy. He had a fleet of 68 ships. And if you look at a Spanish galleon, like a black pearl from Jack Sparrow, it would take three black pearls, and it still wouldn't be as big as one of Zhang Ho's ships. They're huge. And when they got close to a new territory, they would put decorations. One looked like a dragon, another one like a butterfly, another one like a bumblebee, all right? Some like, like wolves. So you saw these giant, colorful, floating ships, and they would say, hey, we want to conquer you. And most guys were like, well, okay, we got nothing to compete with that. And they exacted something known as tribute. Think of Katniss and Peeta, right? Wimpy Peeta, go ice some cupcakes or something. I don't know he's going to go. How did she not choose Gail? That's all I'm saying. It's my person. You know what I'm saying, Matt Gay? Yeah. You're like, really going to bake me a loaf of bread? Please. All right. Anyway. So, um, tribute is the thing that you hold the most dear. All right, so for Katniss and Peta, it was, you know, the lives of the little kids in the different districts. Well, in China, when they rolled up on you, they would say, hey, we want to conquer you. Do you, you want to fight? Most people are like, well, no, we have no chance. And they gave you a chance to send a gift to the emperor, a piece of tribute. If it was seen as worthy of the Chinese emperor, you were absorbed into the Chinese empire. You could trade with China. You were protected by China. You just did the same things throughout time. Acknowledge the emperor as your king. You paid some taxes. And you gave soldiers for the army. If you gave him something really good, you were good to go. If you gave him something crappy and you didn't have anything worthwhile, well, then they just simply conquered you. 
So anyway, this makes China bigger and much, much more powerful. China is still seen as one large family. Everybody has their role. Confucius still reigns. All right? Everybody does their job. Everybody plays their role. Nothing is going to be left undone. And finally, we get to the Cantonese system. Going back to Kublai Khan and the Ming Dynasty, they welcomed foreigners from the Silk Road. All right? Did Marco Polo really make it to China? No, but everyone thinks he did. But Ibn Battuta is there. Other guys are there. And the Chinese want to begin to learn. And then I look at some of these barbarians like, God, you guys are like, are gross. Like, look at you. You behave terribly. And at this time, after the age of exploration, the Europeans are showing up. And it's like, imagine Connor being trapped on a boat with Keegan for like nine months. Connor, what do you want? You guys, Connor may really enjoy that. But let's oh, say... I want to die for the first time. All right. First thing Connor wants to do, man, the boat hits the shore, and Connor is leaping overboard. All right? Sailors come ashore, they're going to they want to be on dry land, they want to get some food, they probably want to go to a pub, maybe to a brothel. Being locked on these ships for nearly a year, the Europeans go crazy, and it's wanton destruction, and it's gross, and so the Chinese are like, ugh. And they limit them to one port down in Canton, called the Cantonese system, where there is a small spit of land that juts out from the mainland. At the end of it, the Europeans could dock their boats and unload their cargo. The Chinese built a miniature Great Wall across the length of this spit, and they guarded it. Chinese could go through the gate, you know, street food carts and vendors, and they could do business and trade with the Europeans, <coughs> but the Europeans could not go through the gate and get into mainland China because they behaved badly. And that is how China is going to remain um, until the age of imperialism. Um, everybody good here with the Great Ming Dynasty? Are you guys are coming to So I'm worried about the heat. Is, anybody, is this registered? Except for Aaron, who is still cold. It's all right. The Qing Dynasty, kind of the last one, 1644 to 911, also known as the Manchu Dynasty. This is right smack dab in the heart of the age of imperialism, where due to the Industrial Revolution, what's going on, man? Never heard Heyday before? Okay. All right. All right. Um, Right smack dab in the heart of imperialism, um, the European countries, due to the Industrial Revolution, are going to go out and they're going to carve up the globe. The Great Scramble has taken place in Africa. The British are giving sepoys bullets covered with um, beef tallow and pig fat. And over in China, they're like, hey, let's take these nice flowers from India, poppies for opium, and we'll go sell them to you cats over here in China. And when England gets there first, all the other European countries, remember in imperialism, it's a competition. If the British are there, we've got to get there too. And everybody is coming after this territory. Well, as a result, China will get bullied. They will fall victim to a thing known as extraterritoriality. An extraterritoriality kind of works like diplomatic um, immunity. If a British sailor gets drunk in China, beats up a bunch of people, or commits a crime, he is not tried by Chinese standards. He's tried by British standards. That whole Cantonese system is gone. Yes, ma'am. Same thing as being extradited? Well, not even extradited. I drum you up in front of a court in China, they're going to find you guilty, right? But you're one of my sailors on board my boat, and I'm like, well, shoot, Sophia's, you clearly didn't do that, right? You're Sophia the first. You and Bailiwick were out doing something. I know you couldn't have done that, so come on, Sophia. So the Chinese, well, we're getting robbed, we're getting wronged, and you're not doing anything to punish your people. I'm like, yeah, but it's... 
Sophia. Like, I can't, you know. And the Chinese were angry. The other thing that makes them mad when the British show up is the famous opium wars. The British would take opium from India, modern day Pakistan, and they would use it to trade with the Chinese. And the Chinese paid them silver. Just throwing silver at the British, like, dude, we're getting rich, we're not even really doing anything. All right? They load the poppies on board, we take and give them the Chinese, and they give us silver. This is great. When China runs out of silver, the British say, we'll take what, Emma? Tea. Tea. All right. All right, we'll take some tea. Then we'll take it back to Great Britain. We'll slap some Twinnings wrappers on it, Earl Grey hot, you know, Darjeeling, this, that, and the other thing. And the British sell that for even more money. So the British are making 100% profit. And China's like, wait a minute. You're getting our people addicted. You aren't trying, to, Sophia. You're grabbing up our land. And the British are like, well, spitzball, too. Yeah, you know, you know Quidditch bats and and cricket bats and Quidditch matches, who's the big deal? And so the Chinese are going to attack. And their old traditional ships, the, the junks, are no match for British industrial power. And the Chinese lose. Then the British say, you know what? When you ran your wooden boat into my metal one, you put a dent in it. So you're going to have to pay reparations payments. Oh wait, you don't have money, any money? Then we will take your land. And so this kicks off a wave of reprisals. There's the great Taiping Rebellion um, in the mid-1800s where the government puts down this rebellion by killing about 20 million people. Nobody hears about it. Why? It's in China. Who knows anything about China in the mid-1800s? Who knows anything about China now? All right, like three people. Okay, great. All right. So nobody knows. Then later on, the boxers, all right, the harmonious fists, um, want to rebel because not only are the Europeans coming in, but you know who else comes in to China at this time? Japan. Freaking tiny little Japan. It's as big as California. Those guys borrow Chinese culture to become a nation. Now they come to China and give them a list of 21 demands saying that you, Japan, are a part of the Japanese Empire. You're a protector. And China's like, what? Look at you. You can't tell us that you're tiny little Japan. But Japan had industrialized. From this point on, China has lost control of their own destiny, and their goal is going to be to try and adopt Western ideals to combat the British, the French, the Germans, and now the Japanese. So this will bring us to 1911. You guys good? All right. Now we're going to go to the Chinese Republic from 1912 to almost the current day. You guys ready for this? My guys, this will be a very quick up review. You guys do nationalism, Manning, Sun Yet Sun, Chiang Kai-shek, Chairman Mao? Yes. All right, great, good. We're going to do it real fast. Sun Yet Sun is an old guy. Comes to power, 19... Oh, Charlie, you have a friend. That's so sweet. Right. Probably doesn't have friends in their period, so we're not that by year here. All right. Is Jessica paying you? No. Okay. All right. Check it off, Charlie. All right, check it off. So anyway, all right. Sun Yat Sun's this old guy. He takes over. And he leads the Chinese Nationalist Party, the Kuomintang, the KMT. And he needs help. And he's looking around to modernize China. He turns to an old Chinese general, a guy named Yuan Shiki, who goes hardcore militaristic on him. And that doesn't work. And Sun Yat Sun had studied in the West. He, you know, him and other Chinese young men had gone out to Great Britain, to Germany, to the United States to learn things. And he comes back and he says, gosh, I got all these ideas, but I don't know how to make them, how to apply them. It's like Peter the Great coming back from the West um, in the 1600s. He's like, can somebody help us? 
England, United States, you guys help Japan, will you help us? Problem is, World War I was going on, or it had just ended. Great Britain is financially broke. France is physically and economically devastated. Germany is broken. In the United States, we are having a great time. Dancing to Charleston, watching Babe Ruth hit home runs, we're eating hot dogs, women are getting the right to vote, it's swing music, it's great. But the Europeans, who we went over there to help and get our first title belt, were making fun of us. So we're like, you know what, fine, next time any of you idiots need help, don't ask us. Enormous mistake made by the West. Because when England, France, and Germany can't help China, and the United States is oblivious, there's one country that has always needed a friend. my little American Celtics. Privet, comrade. We are Mother Russia, Union Soviet Socialist Republics. And for much year we have no friend. No one likes us. Even Charlie has friends now. What we do, all right? And finally, China's going, help. Will somebody help? I hear on the cold Siberian wind, someone say help. Who might that be? And when the Soviet Union has a chance to make a friend, they're like, oh, 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 we will help you. And so Sun Yat Sun will call the Soviet Union the one true friend of China. And he takes his little assistant, Chiang Kai-shek, and says, Chiang, take a couple years and go study what they're doing in the Soviet Union and bring it back. And like four months later, Chiang Kai-shek is back. So your son says, Chiang, supposed to be gone for two years. Well, it's the Soviet Union. It's communism. It's not all that complex. I think I, I, think I got this. And he says, what we need to do is build a big army. Right? We need to nationalize and build a big, giant army to drive out these foreigners. And um, as they begin to form political parties and try and become more Western, China goes through the growing pains that the Western countries did 150 years before. How to have a democracy. Who's going to vote? Um, do we have an election? In the middle of all this, the Japanese begin to invade. And while the Japanese are carving out spheres of influence in China, Sun Yat-sen dies. And instead of fighting Japan, Chiang Kai-shek is hoarding his military supplies and he's hunting the communists. And his main opponent, his antithesis, is Mr. Mao Zedong, who will lead the Communist People's Party, heavily influenced by the Soviet Union. And the two guys, Mao Zedong and Sun Yat-sen, are going to have a civil war, in which Chiang Kai-shek's forces chase Chairman Mao 6,000 miles on what's called the Long March. 90,000 Chinese will begin the long march, 20,000 will finish it. And in the meantime, the Japanese are getting more territory and more territory and more territory. And in 1931, they blow up their own railroad in Manchuria. Part of the provisions that the um, Japanese had with Chinese, if any of their or economic interests are threatened, they can send in their army. So they blow up their own railroad and say, oh, the Chinese did it, the Chinese did it, and they invade. Chiang Kai-shek is running for the hills, and that gives Mao Zedong the time he needs to consolidate his power. He tells his people, be nice to the peasants we come across. Don't steal anything from them. Don't break anything. Offer to buy goods from them. If you can't pay for it, offer to work for it. And he begins to set up these little village councils and says, I'm trying to teach you how to self-govern. This is how I want you to operate. But every time they had a question, 
Who did they have to turn to to get the answer? It's one Chairman. Chairman Mao. All right. So he makes you think that you've got choice, but Chairman Mao is really in um, control. When World War II is over, the Japanese have to surrender to Chiang Kai-shek, but the conflict ensues, and in 1949, Chairman Mao establishes the People's Republic of China. The key thing about a republic, what has to happen? There are two things. One, you got to have laws, and two, Elena, what do you got to do? you got to vote, except in China, how many names are on the ballot? One. One. Kind of makes it hard to lose. So he is elected the um, president of the People's Republic of China. The rich, wealthy people, artists, professors, teachers, business owners flee to Hong Kong and Taiwan, British um, protectorates, to be safe. Very similar to the Roman business leaders, the fall of the Roman Empire, fleeing to Constantinople. And Mao is going to unveil what is known as his cultural revolution, where all society is going to be equal. We're going to have a classless society. But in socialism, communism, how do you get resources? Somebody decides how much you get based on your ability and your needs. But that means someone has to determine what you get, which is going to corrupt them. Why well, give Catherine a lot, but I can give her a little, and I can keep the rest for myself. But Catherine, worry, don't worry. I only have as much as you do. All right. And so this will lead to what is known as the Great Leap Forward in modern China. The great leap forward is like standing and falling flat on your face. It does absolutely nothing but result in the deaths of at least 30 million people. Right. And the great leap forward, Mao Zedong says, you know, the support from the Soviet Union was great. And at this time, what else is going on in the world? It's 1958. The Cold War, all right? And everybody is kind of boxed in between the United States and NATO and the Soviet Union. And China's like, wait a minute, we're big and we're powerful. Let's flex a little muscle. Let those two idiots fight each other. We're going to do our own thing. We are going to be independent. And they did hire a couple Soviet advisors to come over. The Chinese quickly realized... Well, dang, these guys, what they're doing really isn't all that smart. And Joseph Stalin, um, Stalin's five-year plans were simply quotas. In five years, Max, you're going to make this many shoes. Sonia, you're going to make this many winter coats so Aaron can be warm. Melody, you're going to grow this much food. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. And once you met your quota, you were... You were done, right? Assuming that you had enough raw materials, you had enough gasoline, you had enough, um, Max, what are you making again? Oh, you, that you had enough leather to make boots. Once you make your quota, the um, manufacturing, the production, and the shipping is all going to run like a Swiss watch. There's going to be no holdups um, into it. We're just going to do that because it sounds good. And we're going to create a bunch of southern villages. Right? We're going to create every little village is going to have its own school, its own houses, its own grocery stores, and it'll be self sufficient. Like an old medieval village. All right? You're not going to have to go anywhere. You're going to be in your little collective. And your village is going to sustain itself and then take your extra and give it up for the government. So what incentive is there for you to work? Not a whole lot, because anything extra I get gets taken away. Now it sounds good. All right? Oh, it's all going to be equal, we're going to be self-sufficient, and it's going to be great. And everybody is given that quota. This is how much food you need to grow 
These are how many roads and irrigation canals and bridges and railroad track you need to build. Problem is, for Manning's people, we're going to introduce you to my friend Bob. All right, Bob is a guy that I worked next to in the summers in high school at a General, Motive, um, General Motors factory. And Bob ran an impact wrench. He, for 12 hours a day, screwed five lug nuts onto wheels of cars. And Bob had a tooth here and Bob had a tooth here. Bob would be like, Morgan, well, you dumb, you gone to college, I'm making more money than you, this is the greatest job ever. And I was going stupid, because I had to put the wheels on the car. It was the most boring job of all time, but it paid good. Bob was a sweet guy. Bob was a nice guy. Bob was also dumb as a brick, all right? Um, Bob needed help to go to the bank so he could manage his paycheck. Well now, in this system in China, who's in charge of the village or the factory? Bob, all right? Does Bob know what he's doing? Bob, boo, boo, run an impact wrench for 12 hours a day. But Bob, I don't think he left town because he might not be able to find his way home, all right? That was Bob. Bob is in charge. And the Great Leap Forward is a great disaster, and it kills at least 30 million people. So in the last 100 years in China, not counting World War II, just internal um, problems, the Taipei Rebellion and the Great Leap Forward, 50 million people have died. Right? That's how um, bad it is. During all this, we're going to have the great cultural revolution where we are going to get rid of all non-communist practices. Anything that is an ancient Chinese, anything that even smacks of westernization, music, art, clothing, dress, books, all of it has to go. Mao Zedong runs the How to Be a Dictator for Dummies playbook page by page. Now, as always, when we're a totalitarian dictator, what do we got to have that makes us super scary? Secret. secret police, all right? Let's unleash our secret police, all right? We're going to go out and we're going to find people. And young kids, we're known as Red Guards. What can you do to help China? And the whole place was turned into competition. Chinese ratted each other out. Sons their fathers, daughters their mothers sisters and brothers, each other, so they could look good. And if you turned in somebody, you got your meager react, um, ration increased a small bit. So the whole place was just very, very, very taunt. Anybody who's educated, anybody who wanted you to think was killed or arrested, so most of them ran and left and said, we're um, tapping out. Thousands are starving homeless, jobless, and it looks like civil war is going to break out. Oh my God, what's going to happen next? Anybody know? I told you China was big and long. All right. And so we get to this point, all right. China was being told what to do by the Soviet Union, and they say no. Mao Zedong is going to give more decision-making powers to the peasant class. I don't know if you guys can see that. I tried to wrap it up with one more slide. He says he's using Marxism, but he's doing it to meet the needs of China. And during this latter period, the 1960s, at the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and China are competing with each other to impose their brand of communism on smaller third world countries. And mercifully, 1976, Mao Zedong, he dies. All the time presenting himself as the grandfather of the um, people. And he's replaced by this guy, Chairman Deng. Chairman Deng begins to allow some laissez-faire, some private business. And so to this day... Um, China has been a combination of communist capitalism. Right? Once Max meets his quota, anything else that he makes, he can sell and keep for his own profit. Does that sound like communism? 
No, but you got to meet the quota first. Also, because they were reaching over a billion people, they imposed the one child law, where families, unless you had twins, were only allowed to have one child. Boy, has this backfired on them recently. You might have been to China recently. There's a whole lot of Chinese guys and not a whole lot of Chinese ladies. And the guys want to get married, but the only problem is <laughs> it's hard to find a young lady to marry because, well, we're going to have one. And so lots of Chinese girls, this is a side story, were put up for adoption, left in um, foster homes because everybody wanted the patriarchal um, male. By the 1980s, Things are looking better, and um, President Nixon in 1973 um, or 1972 re-engages trade with China. President Clinton is the first Westerner to go into the Forbidden City, and China with all of its cultural treasures, the Great Wall, the Terracotta Warriors, is a boom for tourism. Bring people over. How many of you guys went over with Schliemann and Page and, and Smith? Anybody go over there? Okay, all right, never mind. What, what, what the hell am I talking about? I don't even, I'm uh, really, no. And students go west and they learn about these ideas about democracy. So in 1989, I remember it well. If you look at my boy back here behind Charlie and Ashley, we have the Great Tenement Square where students began to protest the repressive government in China in Tiananmen Square. Um, Prime Minister Deng responds, as always, by sending in the military to scatter um, these students. But things are looking better. China is only going to be communist for so much longer. You guys remember the 2008 Olympics yeah. and the coming out of, you know, those were some pretty cool um, opening ceremonies. So anyway, um, big problem in China right now with the remote chance we get it on a DBQ is human rights violations. Okay, everybody done with China? I'm done with China. No offense to China. Bam. What do you guys want to do next? We can do India. We can do something else. What do you guys want to do? We got 20 minutes, 25 minutes. What's next? Islam. Islam's huge. I don't want to start that today. Sorry, Kat, because it is massive. We'll do that one Thursday. What's that? You want to do India? Yeah. Any other votes for India? All right, give you guys a break. We'll do some pictures, then we'll go back to some words. India, Indian subcontinent, huge, gigantic, massive. Modern day India, we know, juts out from the southern part of um, Asia, but it's made up of more than just India. It's also Pakistan, it is Bangladesh. And it is a large landmass shoving its way into mainland Asia. Three of the world's ten most populated countries exist on this subcontinent. This red is population center. So where does everybody in India live? On the coastlines, up by the Ganges and in China. There's a whole lot of people on the east coast. China has forever been kept safe by the mountains. We got the Hindu Kush over here, up here we got the Himalayas, and down here we've got the Indian Ocean right smack dab in the middle. We have the Great Deccan Plateau, where the only thing people who live there are in Indian witness relocation because it's like Arizona in Nevada, where there's like eight people. Why? Because it's a giant desert. So you want to live along the rivers, like the Ganges up here where it looks real pretty like that, or along the coasts. India is going to have several big rivers. The two most important are the Indus and the Ganges. Whoops. And India is going to depend upon monsoons, seasonal winds, to this day. Part of the year, the winds bring heavy moisture and rain coming across Africa and the Indian Ocean. They give life-giving water to India. But in the fall, the winds reverse course. And it's like someone takes a giant blow dryer and points it right at India. And it cooks and bakes the subcontinent. And so here, 
we get the Indus River Valley civilization, the only one that has been settled two times. First time, the ancient Indian civilization formed the twin cities of Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro. If you get an essay question about technology and monumental architecture, whether it's in India, whether it's in Africa, whether it's the Mayas, the Incas, the Aztecs, whether it's Louis XIV building Versailles, when you have large public works projects like the identical cities of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa, it demonstrates three things. Number one, you've got a strong central authority. Somebody is saying this is what we're going to do and how we are going to do it. Number two, you have um, you are highly organized, building materials, building people. All of these things are shipped. You can't have people standing around waiting to work. And number three, a knowledge of complex mathematics. Should you go to Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro today, they're ruins, but they are exactly identical. You could go to your neighborhood in your house in Harappa, you could go to Mahanyodaro, go to your neighborhood and find your house. The only thing is there'd be somebody else. Oh, God. Okay, great. Wonderful. Go, soccer ladies. I hope they win. Senior night. Awesome. All right. Um, bizarrely, in 1500, after making money, Harappa and Mahanyodaro, they disappear, and we don't know why. A little while later, there are a bunch of people in southern Russia, and they make much long migration. They go down in the Middle East, and I Turkey, and Iraq, and Iran, in Afghanistan. And like, oh my God, hey Peter, yes, Ivan, should we go home? No, we've been walking much long. Let's keep going. And finally, they get to the Indus River Valley in modern day Pakistan. They're like, dude, look, there's this big blue river all these great green fields, and there's nobody, nobody here. So it is Aryans, Indo-Europeans, who will resettle India around 1500 B.C. These nomads are going to resettle the area. They are going to form what we know today as traditional Indian or Hindu culture. They're going to stop along the Indus and up here along the Ganges rivers. Uh, it's at this time that the Aryans will measure their worth in cattle. So my dad, a dairy farmer, would be wealthy. They'd be like, whoop, all right, look at this. This is awesome. All right, go. All right. And by 500, right around the classical ages, India is made up of many different individual kingdoms that are going to blend the Aryan and the traditional Dravidian um, Indian way of life that's going to help form what we know as the religion of Hinduism. Now, um, the Aryans are going to come along, and they're going to bring with them these really important ideas known as the Vedas. And the Vedas are a group of religious hymns and prayers that for hundreds of years are passed down orally. You guys had to memorize them, or the, not you guys, the people had to um, memorize them. And then eventually, they are written down. And it is the fourth book, known as the Rig Veda, that is the most important. It kind of gives us a look into how um, this early um, political and religious life look. And it's here where we get the social scale, that what we know as the caste system. The highest caste are the priestly class known as Brahmins. Second class we have the warriors, or the Kshatriyas. And then, think of like the, um, the States General in the French Revolution. Um, everybody else is a Vaya, herder, farmer, artisan, merchant. And some down at the bottom, We've got the Shudras, the untouchables, or the criminals. They do the nasty hard work, like butchering, burying dead bodies, emptying out um, outhouses, because, well, they did something incorrect. And we review the religion um, part of it. We will um, talk about that. We're going to 
flip down here. Um, we're going to come back to this. Um, I think I got some more down here. Um, you did this. Ah, oh, yes. Um, I want to tell you about three or a couple different um, dynasties in the last ten minutes. The first of which is, I thought I had some more stuff down here. Do I? Uh, all right. um, anyway, um, we have the great um, uh, Mayora dynasty. The Mayora dynasty um, is the first big unified, where India is unified into one massive empire. It is synonymous with ancient Greece. When Greece was in its heyday, it's when the Mayora dynasty was in its heyday. As Alexander the Great was moving eastward, the Mayora dynasty was moving westward. It would have been awesome if Alexander the Great's army and Chandragupta's army had a throwdown, but it never happens. And the Mayor dynasty is going to have the Asian version of um, Athens. I always misenunciate this. Miss Rajan always like makes fun of me for it. Patalapitura is the best that I can do. This beautiful, lavish city of great architecture, libraries, medicine. It's Alexandria in Asia. Um, and this is all done by the big leader Chandragupta um, Mayora, um, who was surprisingly guarded. I think very cool. He thought that his um, male bodyguards were corrupt and would get jealous. So he was guarded by an elite um, squad of 400 female bodyguards who were like Amazon. They were ferocious and terrifying. And people were um, terrified of them. Um, Chandragupta will build a centralized bureaucracy. He was a dominant king. And everything, laws flowed through him. And he said his goal was to establish justice for everyone, from rich to poor. And like all good leaders, he uses a secret um, police force. Now... Well, we have this next guy, Ashoka. I like Ashoka. Ashoka is a descendant of Chandra Ragupta, and he's a warrior. And what do you do when you're a warrior? What's vogue and cool to do? Expand the empire. And there's this enormous bloody battle. Thousands of people are slaughtered. And when it's over and Ashoka looks over the battlefield, he decides to convert to Buddhism. And he plunks down these pillars with four lines on them. And he promised, when you walk inside those pillars, I promise good government for everyone. And to connect India to the Silk Road trading, he builds a vast network of roads. He digs water wells. He builds hotels, every one about 20 to 25 miles apart, to facilitate trading. And also spreads Buddhism from India into China. It is already at this time where Asia is getting connected via Alexander the Great to the ideas of Greece and Hellenism. The combination of Greek and Egyptian and Persian and Indian learning. And so from China to the Middle East to the kingdom of Aksum, the big city of Kilwa in Africa, things are being traded along the Silk Road. This period aids um, cultural diffusion. Unfortunately, when Ahsoka dies, India collapses. And this brings us, this is my, where we'll stop for the day, and we'll go back to do the Mughals, maybe some period. We'll do the Mughals. we got six minutes. You guys doing okay? Is this too fast? All right, let's roll. All right. Gupta Dynasty. Very quick, where Mayora was compared to Greece, Gupta is compared to ancient Rome. A golden age of Indian peace and prosperity. When connected to the Silk Road, when stabilized without wars or civil wars, civil wars, people sit down in their thinking chairs and they think, think, think. 
And so the Indians made great advancements in mathematics with algebra. And if you're a uh, dunderheaded ninny muggins like myself, come on, man. Why did you make it a letter if you wanted it to be a number? I don't understand that nonsense. Do you get that, Christina? Nine times nine is 81. I don't need to draw boxes or a number line. I don't know. It's not a Y. It's not an X. Those are letters. Well, you guys have, like, no comedy after school whatsoever. Okay, no historical comedy. Okay. All right. Um, medicine, acupuncture, complex surgery, um, numbing the pain, anesthesia, um, and the mathematical concepts of physics that are very similar to the ones that Archimedes is going to come up with over in the Greco-Roman world. Because of living in India and trading, just about everybody in India was multilingual, speaking um, several different languages, including um, Chinese. And what I think is really cool, you're looking at like the measles and mumps outbreaks going out in California, ancient Gupta India had a smallpox vaccine way back at this time. The only negative is the caste system will be integrated into daily life. It becomes an established thing that will carry on for a long, long, long time. That is how India is going to remain, just traditional buying, selling, trading. Um, they're going to run into the Portuguese um, and Europeans when Vasco da Gama comes over. And everybody loves India because when you take Indian spices and put them on food, all of a sudden it tastes good. It has this crazy thing known as flavor. Until we make a big jump to the 1500s. Um, factoring in Islam for Lady Charles here. In the 1500s, Islam is going to spread into India. And this gives birth to the great Mughal dynasty. And the Mughal dynasty will last just about a hundred years. And it started by um, descendants of just a force of violence, death, and destruction, Tamerlane or Timur the Lane or whatever. He was a half Mongol, half Turkish Muslim warlord that left a wake of pestilence and death behind him. And when the Muslims settle in northern India, with power and technology, they end the fragmentation and reunify India. But instead of traditional Hindus being in charge, it's Muslims. And there's a lot of tension between the, the two groups. Hinduism is an old religion. Islam to the Indians was relatively new. Hinduism is a combination of polytheism and monotheism, and Islam is monotheistic. In Islamic society, everybody's equal. In Hindu society, there's the caste system. So there's a lot of tension. And it brings in the most famous ruler of, of India at this time, Akbar the Great, who was a conqueror, just like everybody else. But when he's done... It's how he governed of the only monarch in the world at the time that was religiously tolerant. He brings people in, Jewish rabbi, Christian bishops, Islamic ulama, you know, Buddhist monks, um, Shinto priests. And he says, guys, let's sit down and let's look more at what we have in common than what divides us. To be a good person is pretty much the same thing. So he rules on tolerance. He appoints Hindus to high governmental um, positions. He redoes his government so it's beneficial and kind to the um, people. And he orders a census. All your prime time monarchs do this. And we find out that if Aaron has a bumper crop of food and Ali over here is struggling, then for this year, Aaron will pay a little bit more taxes than poor Allie. If Emma 
consumes a lot more resources than little tiny village melody, who's going to pay more 